Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to the Second Messiah. On the last episode of the Second Messiah we saw Vithericus moving south and then east, encountering Tarsus as he moved along the coast following his route along land towards Egypt. Meanwhile Saphrax was raiding Roman towns just northeast of Italia, still not moving quite into the Romans' core territory. In Tarsus, Vithericus created himself a new ally liberating Judea, a powerful ally for ourselves. We then found ourselves declaring war on the Sassanid Empire as they refused to let us pass through their lands, so now Vithericus is in danger, while Saphrax is enjoying freedom as the Romans still haven't come to engage him. He begins to move into Italia, realizing the Romans aren't going to stop him. The Sassanids send their main force, led by their faction leader Barum, to come and attack the stewards of Divine just beside Tarsus. The battle was close and bloody, but in the end, the terrain really did not favour the enemy's cataphract heavy army, and we were just about able to beat them, and now we have a chance to wipe out the survivors. I was told you were scared of the Goths. Why? The Goths are only coming because they're too weak to hold their own lands. They might best the border guards, but now they'll have to face the cold steel of the Legio. You, how many troops does the city command? The 300 can be mastered at- Can you double it? I should think so. Triple it. I'll procure the arms. Send to the wharf and have them stock anything that touches shore. For what purpose? Siege preparations. You can't let them besiege the city. You have to fight them before they arrive. Then you lead the men. We will hold them on the walls. Our men will fight hardest defending their homes. And the longer the Goths march, the more weary they become. They want to reach Rome and will have to assault our fortifications to get there. They say Roman engineering isn't what it used to be. We shall show them that we haven't lost our touch for a structure that invites the death of Rome's enemies. Expect my men to arrive in two days. I want them fed and housed without any undue cheapness. You will soon be owing these men your lives. So we're in the aftermath of that battle against the Sassanid Empire. A close victory where we lost a lot of men but only one full regiment and the enemy's army lost pretty much everything there. The enemy's leader though, their faction leader, survived and escaped with his surviving troops to the east there. So next turn we're going to have our stack able to go and chase him down and eliminate him if we so wish. On the way to the end of this turn, we are called into a war by our allies, the Gepids. They're going to war with some random faction who I don't think I'm uh, able to actually see on the diplomacy map. So, since I'm probably not going to end up actually fighting them, I might as well enter the war in order to maintain my alliance and my good standing among other factions. And now, as we hit the year 400, the big man himself enters the game. They made ready for war. The world had fallen into shadow. The earth grew cold, and the wind whispered of death. And I beheld a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of scales in his hand. Attila was born. All knelt before him. For they knew he would devour the earth and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Attila was born from darkness and despair. So there you have it, Attila is born and will soon enough become the leader of the Huns which of course makes them spawn about a million stacks and start taking over the world but we don't have to worry about that right now, the apocalypse isn't quite yet upon us, we've still got our business to attend to. You can see I have a matter of state here, tribute, this is always an interesting matter of state, I've seen it uh, several times actually, where someone has basically just showed up to offer you a gift and you have the option to not accept it, accept it, or just kill the bearer. <laughs> Seems a little harsh, but anyway, I'll accept the gift. I also decided to send Ejika, my bastard brother, over to be a retainer to Safrax, hoping he'll uh, learn a few more skills over there and to generally get Ejika out of my hair. 
So he is going to now make the long journey between our camp and Safrax's camp if he can find it. In between, you can see here the Huns are still besieging Constantinopolis. They've been doing so for a long time and they're going to keep doing it. It seems they intend to totally wear the city down even though they have a massive advantage and can just take it and do whatever they want to it if they so pleased. Anyway, you can see Baram and his survivors are now hanging around on the edge of the Judean territory and my force has almost completely regenerated in just one turn. A combination of taking on warriors from the battle and getting a turn of regeneration whilst encamped in allied territory means I get loads of troops back. So I'm able to move over and attack the Sassanid army. It just stands and lets me fight it and we brutally behead the faction leader Baron there using a protective stance to minimize losses and I'll take on some warriors from the remaining survivors there to uh, get some of those guys back. So we've wiped out the immediate Sassanid thread. The other Sassanid army that was hanging around near Antioch isn't there anymore so I don't know where it went. But the fact that I just defeated their faction leader means it's pretty likely they'll send forces over to attack me for revenge. Or perhaps they're so scared having defeated their main force that they're not going to send anyone over at all and I'm fine. I guess we'll find out. For now I'm just going to encamp, regenerate the rest of my army. I'm also going to recruit a new unit because I've still got one slot free. And since the Sassanids have shown so far that they're deploying these big cavalry heavy armies, I decided I'm going to need some spearmen. I'm going to gradually transition this army to have more spears in it in order to deal with this uh, threat as we move through their territory. So now we're jumping back over to Safrax. Safrax is having, a, having sorry, a pretty easy time right now. He's just walking into Italia, previously something I was nervous about doing, but it's proving pretty damn easy. The uh, Romans aren't defending their territory whatsoever, so we move up to Verona and can just cut down the small defending army here. Verona is one of the interesting territories on the route because it controls the river crossing, and like one of the previous towns we moved through, even after you attack and are victorious in battle, you can't actually use the river crossing. Curiously, the game also tells me about about Baron being killed at this point for some reason. Anyway, so as you can see, I can't move through on the road or use their bridge. If I want to get across this river, I'm going to have to use all of my movement points to cross the river just at any random point, which is a little bit annoying, but I don't have a choice at this point. So I'm just going to move over towards the river and basically encamp beside it. I can get a little bit of regeneration and money doing so, so it's not so bad. And then next turn, I'll just have to dedicate the movement of uh, this horde to getting everyone across the river. I'm also able to recruit a unit here. You can see I can recruit uh, some very weak looking looking pikemen here, but actually since I'm going to be facing heavy Roman infantry with this army, axemen are going to be the way to go. Bet he thinks I'm going to betray him. Sends me halfway across the world and tells me he needs me to do what the traitor Sefrax says. What does he want me to learn from this exactly? The family I'm being shunned by would rather have me in the camp of their enemies? Probably trying to find an excuse to kill me. Maybe he thinks Sefrax will kill me. That old hound must have gone mad with power by now. Probably forgot how much he used to kiss father's arse. Oh well, guess I'll just have to enjoy the trip. I'll just get a few of these guards killed off as we go. More wine for me that way. So now we reach the next turn. The Sassanids didn't come to attack me with an army, but they did send an agent to harass me. Ejiga has successfully reached Safrax and the children of Uim, so he now hopefully will be learning a few things from him. So here we can see a Sassanid agent has successfully misdirected my army. That means I have reduced movement points, so although the coast appears to be clear to move, I can't move very far, which is a little bit inconvenient. But I'll do what I can, because if the Sassanids aren't going to attack me, then I'll try and sneak past, because of course I don't need to fight them, I just need to get through this region. We learn that Judea has declared war on the Eastern Romans, quite useful, and rather they declared war on the Sassanids, but still, good to know they'll be distracting my enemy. You can also see here that the Asians are attacking the Eastern Roman Empire territory up there, so it looks like the Eastern Roman Empire are going to have their hands full, they're probably not going to pursue me as I start to leave their territory. I still have some of their lands to go through here, but of course this is the battlefront with the Sassanids, I'm fairly sure the Romans don't have anything around here. So the first step will be to go and lay siege to Antioch to do what the Sassanids were doing when I first discovered them. Of course this is going to take a couple of turns so that I can get my siege equipment ready and of course the Sassanids may just come over while I'm standing here besieging the town and force me to run away so it's a bit risky but I'm going to need to do it and uh, hopefully I can use this grace period where the Sassanids aren't bothering to attack me to get that siege over with and then continue. 
And speaking of uh, getting sieges over with, it looks like the Illyrians are not doing that. They've been besieging Salona for a very long time. A rebellion has sprung up in the province. I don't know what they're trying to do there because the province is clearly very weak. I think the AI just has a little bit of an obsession with keeping those sieges going. So next up, we're over with Safrax. He has to defeat the garrison at Verona once again in order to get rid of its zone of control. So another easy victory with easy experience for these men. I'm going to quickly sack the town, not making much money, and now I think about trying to get across this river. You can see it's going to use loads of my movement points just to cross it. I lost pretty much everything there. Still have just enough to move over towards the road. And next turn, I'll be able to hit the valuable Roman city of Ravenna, which is, by the looks of it, defended by actual Roman forces. So we may see a bit of resistance. Perhaps they'll even come out to challenge me to battle as I advance. But since they're weaker than me, that seems unlikely. So now moving forward another turn, the Sassanid agent has once again misdirected my forces, but of course since they're just doing a siege screen against Antioch, that doesn't hugely matter. So they're going to need another turn to keep building the siege equipment, so I just have to leave them to it really. You can see there's no mercenary oranges available to make that go a little bit faster, so they'll just keep that situation going for now. The Judeans, you can see, have moved their army south. It looks like they may be going to attack the route ahead of me, taking out those Eastern Roman Empire uh, towns there, which would be incredibly useful because that'll make it very easy for me to continue on the next part of my journey. So hopefully this ally I built for myself is going to prove very useful in the near future. We'll see. So let's jump back over to the west, where Safrax is now going to be able to start his siege of Ravenna here. The zone of control of Verona is still covering Safrax's position, so I had to go back first to kill those guys again in a slightly nonsensical move. So we wiped them out, and that will free us up to actually walk away, which was what we were trying to do, so <laughs> it doesn't really make any logical sense, but that's just how the game works. So we sack it again for pretty much no money whatsoever, used a few movement points, but we still have plenty in order to get to our sieging position here. So we'll move in. The Roman army is still inside but suffering attrition apparently so they may have issues in this province already and we're about to make life worse for them. Interestingly they have some steppe troops in there so this army seems to be a well-travelled one. I'm not sure where it's from but I guess it doesn't matter because we'll try and defeat them all the same. The balance bar is only slightly in our favour and because this is going to be a siege attack the enemy probably have a pretty good chance of holding me off so I'm going to want to build as much siege equipment as possible and keep this siege going to weaken the defenders before I make my attack. In response to the constant harassment by agents from the Sassanids, I'm going to hire myself an agent of my own, hiring a spy, Amalric, into our forces. I had a quick look over the other options, but Amalric won out. He is of criminal mind, and although he'll be of a lesser rank than the enemy's agent, we'll have a chance of getting rid of him. And of course, having a spy to go ahead of the horde as it moves could be very useful to help us avoid uh, walking into any traps or unseen dangers. So hopefully Amalric will have a successful career guiding the stewards of the divine for the rest of their journey. But now it's the Sassanid turn and they decide to bring some stacks down to interfere with my siege of Antioch, bringing two armies to attack. The balance bar, as it comes up here, you can see, is uh, not very far in our favour. The armies are similar to the one we faced already, with uh, crossbow cav, loads of cataphracts and heavy spearmen and a few special units. I retreat from that particular battle, and luckily for me, the enemy don't really chase me down. They just sort of stand around for a bit, and then in fact one of the stacks decides to move away. So it could be the case that I can now move back towards Antioch, take out one of the stacks while it stands there, and then face the other one in a defensive battle. But Unfortunately, stopping me doing that is the fact that my army Ready was misdirected. But before that, we've got an interesting choice here. It seems that some sort of vote in Christianity is going on, and for some reason, uh, they've decided to let us take a vote despite being a heretic horde. So I can vote for this guy who's sort of more of an outsider, basically rebelling against the re religious establishment, or I can vote against him. And it just says the die is cast, not totally sure what that does. So after a large amount of consideration, I decided I would vote for this guy because he's uh, not really going along with the Nicene Creed. And the Nicene Creed is sort of the opposite of Arian Christianity as far as I know. I believe uh, Nicene, Nicenean Christianity is the form that Arianism is the exact opposite of. So we're going to vote for that guy and see what the consequences are later on. But anyway, as I said, my movement points have been hampered by this agent, so my plan to sort of rush out, take out that enemy army is a little bit doused. Pontus declares war on the Eastern Roman Empire there, potentially useful. Hopefully they'll, they'll uh, help my ally Asia in defeating the local Eastern Roman Empire garrisons. 
So since I can't really reach that army, I decided I probably wouldn't really bother because I don't want to go out there, be out of movement points if the assassins come to attack with a bigger force so I can't retreat or anything like that. So instead, I just move forwards a little bit, making a tiny else? bit of progress, but just sitting next to my ally, really. I'll encamp, make some money, make some troops, and try and get rid of this agent for next time. So it's time for Amalric to have his first go at doing an action. All he can do is deceive. Which unfortunately isn't too useful. I don't have any movement, uh, sorry, uh, level up points, so I can't unlock anything else. It also means I can't do a defensive action, which was actually what I really wanted to do, to embed him in the army, because I'm sure that agent's going to act against me again and potentially take him out by having an embedded agent. But I'm going to have to take the risk. Not a very good probability on the attack, but I go for it. He's going to try and take him out. Unfortunately, he failed. He was only wounded rather than killed, luckily for me. But that expensive agent has uh, proven completely useless. We've just fed the enemy's experience and the stewards of the divine are still going to be vulnerable to agent attack. My king, I have failed you. Failure is the nature of the steps to success. If you learn from it, I will, I have your highness. I learned that Harmist is, uh, he isn't into women like most folk. So you had someone try to seduce him then? In a sense, my king, except that it wasn't someone. It, it was me. Ah, I see. So you learned of his nature and then tried to seduce him yourself. Actually, my king, I didn't learn it until it was over. I thought I'd save money on girls by dressing up like one myself. Oh, well, quite forward thinking of you, Amalric. But I think the beard might have given you away. My beard? Oh, bugger. I knew I forgot something. How much did we pay this guy again? Next up, I decided that I wanted Vithericus to try and secure the loyalty of his brother-in-law, Gylamere, who is potentially going to be the next officer who will follow the Steward of the Divine if we create a new horde. He's about half loyal to me at the moment, so room for improvement. I'm going to go for it, spend some of Vithericus's influence in order to try and get him a little bit more on board, just to make sure things are okay. Now in the Sassanid turn, they decide to make another attack, moving first a force towards Antioch and then two armies around using the roads to the north to attack the students of the Divine from that strange direction. The balance bar is not all that bad, but the enemy do have the advantage. You can see it's another cataract filled army, probably a situation where the actual terrain of the battlefield will dictate how the battle goes. So I decided to just check and see if we do have some useful terrain like we did last time with all the hills that will break up their cataract charges and protect, uh, protect me sorry, from missile fire. Unfortunately, the terrain's really far at the enemy's advantage, completely useless for us, so this isn't a good place to fight a dangerous battle. I order my guys to retreat and they retreat right through the enemy's camps both of them to a position that's actually right next to where they were originally a bit of a weird retreat path really dangerous actually because now i'm sort of trapped here the Sassanid agent goes after me but the armies don't attack me so i somehow get away with that i was very nervous that that was going to be the end that particular poor retreat but we've gotten away with it ready for battle theudis one of the officers in safrax's camp is trying to get himself promoted by the looks of things theudis is one of the vocal enemies of the therapist so i'm going to block it the result of the vote from the Council of Toledo, I think, is that my side won, the one I voted for, but the actual practical result is religious schism, which doesn't affect me in any way really, it's about uh, province management. Unforeseen complications mean that Vithericus has failed to secure the loyalty of Gylamir and we've lost some of our control, but losing that control alters the balance of power in faction politics. And that uh, reduction in the balance of power actually gives plus one loyalty to everyone. So as a result, we actually have increased Gaelmir's loyalty and everyone else's. So in the end, that yeah. didn't turn out so bad. You can see most people are actually quite loyal towards me, which is very useful. And I'm going to make Safrax a tribal chief, further increasing his influence and giving him some slightly more useful bonuses. So now we need to do something with the Stewards of the Divine. They're in this very dangerous situation. They've got two stacks between them and allied territory, and the Judean army itself is now laying siege to Antioch, curiously enough. So that'll be quite good if they expand out into that territory, expand the amount of allied lands I have to move through. So what I decided to do was try and go right back around to the north again of the Sassanids' new position. Ideally, I want to try and fight one of these stacks rather than both, or I want to fight both where the situation from the terrain is really advantageous, because we saw the balance bar wasn't that far in the enemy's favour, so the combination of those two stacks isn't unbeatable. We just need a nice place which, in which sorry, to conduct our defensive battle. 
In the hunt for such a location, I'm going to set up a position here on the road leading north uh, into the Roman territory. What I actually really wanted to do was set up an ambush, because you can see here there are loads of forested positions I could sit in. But uh, actually, I don't think you can set up an ambush as a migrating faction, because effectively, you're a massive crowd of potentially hundreds of thousands of people, is what you're supposed to represent. So I don't think you can really ambush people, per se. But anyway, what I am going to do is come and sit Getting here, on uh, right on the edge of the impassable forest, because those areas tend to be well covered, well uh, suited to anti-cavalry tactics, and maybe quite hilly. So the enemy's missile and cavalry advantage won't work to their advantage in such a location. You can see here I was checking the stances to see if there was anything useful or ambushy things I could do, but no. We're just going to wait there and see if the enemy attack this position, which hopefully, if the cards fall right, will be in our advantage. In other news, you can see the Illyrians have finally decided to capture Lona about time. My allies, the Visigoths, are attacking Thessalonica, so that's more good news. Overall, the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire are starting to fall to my allies all around the shop, which is excellent news. The Huns still besieging Constantinople, and the Asians still attempting to move south. Uh, those projects going a lot more slowly for some reason. But anyway, back to the actual matter at hand. The Sassanids do attack my position here. The balance bar has shifted in my favour from last time, perhaps because of the terrain. So let's take a look at the uh, scouting map and see what we've got. Seeing the map here, I decided I'm definitely going to fight this battle. We've got a massive mountainous position just in front of our deployment zone, and the enemy is deploying way downhill. So overall, uh, we're going to have an excellent position with which to stop the enemy's charge coming uphill. Plus, there's all sorts of forests and little ridges everywhere that are going to break up their attack. This is a perfect chance to defeat the enemy's heavy cavalry and superior missile infantry. We have them trapped at the gates of hell. Send to the captains. Not a single man is to be spared, child or fully grown. I want the women in chains lined up on that very hillside. Oh, but actually I want the Theracus and his family to be brought to me alive. I want that cursed demon to see what I will do to his family, see what happens to heathens, see how the death of his highness is an act that no man or god will ever forgive. I will stamp out these insects with the hooves of 10,000 horses and destroy all that remains of their kingdom with the fury of a million righteous sons of Baram. And then, well, we shall see that the occasion is marked appropriately. So here is the battlefield where Vithericus is going to make his stand, a giant forested hill that the enemy are going to have to climb all the way up to meet his army here right at the top. I started my deployment behind the hill, so I'm just coming over the top in order to take up a position where I'll be looking down at the Sassanid advance. And you can see all of the undergrowth allows many of my units to be hidden as they take up their formation up here, which is rather useful. So the enemy are coming in in two groups. First, they're just going to sit at the base of the hill and wait for their two armies to combine forces. The second army full of these heavy cataphracts. The balance bar, as you can see, does not look very good for us. So that army combines up and then starts its movements up the hill. As they're coming up, they decided to send their cavalry out in front of the army. At this point, I actually can't see any of the enemy because in the uh, actual playing of the battle, I don't have line of sight on them. So I only discover them as uh, they reach the crest of the hill at about this point, suddenly appearing out of the trees from my perspective. Tons of cataphracts. They spot me as well, though, because they didn't know where I was. And they change their course. They're going to go around the flank, my right flank, with loads of these cataphracts. That is the place where the hill is the steepest, but it's also where it's least defended. Meanwhile, on the front, they've got other cataphracts charging forward to slam into my spear lines. I've got my guys in spear wall, increasing their resistance to charges, but the enemy still go right through and then slam into their flanks with those guys who came around the side. So it looks like that part of the battle is going to be a little bit dodgy. Meanwhile, in the middle, the enemy's cataphract charge is more easily repulsed. They charge into my spear wall, which successfully holds its formation. The enemy are now stuck and forced to fight in melee, which is not their forte, being shot cavalry. And because they're right in front of my missile units, they're going to be taking uh, arrows and javelins the whole time they're stuck there. Very quickly, many of the enemy's heavy cavalrymen are killed in that quick engagement there. So their frontal assault has failed, our line has held, and much of the line is still unengaged engaged as you can see. My bowmen are engaging in a missile fight with the enemy's missile units but the enemy has a big advantage here. They've got tons of their own bowmen plus loads of these horse archers and their combined power means I'm pretty much losing this skirmish. I've already lost more than half of my archers after just a quick back and forth. My men are not going to be able to hold up for very long and I think I lose an entire regiment of archers in this part of the fight. 
some of the enemy's advanced infantry and now fighting with my infantry should go okay for me because I'm fighting downhill and in many cases the enemy enemies are only have spearmen and I'm charging forward to axemen who should be able to hack through them plus as you can see I've got javelin support taking out many of the enemies so my men will now hold out against these enemies and gradually try to push them back meanwhile on the flank where the enemy are doing their mass cavalry attack I put my own cavalry into the fray my guys are only light but are okay in melee against the enemy's shock cav and I'm putting more and more spearmen in but you can see the enemy have tons more cavalry still waiting to come and attack on that flank so the fight isn't over yet now the enemy's main body of infantry is starting to advance towards the centre, the very messy centre. We can see I'm just finishing off some enemy units by surrounding them, but they've got all these heavy spears. We're now going to join the battle and they're in much better order than my line is. So they're going to be getting flank attacks and rear attacks on my units as they try to reform and already some of my units are severely depleted from the fighting that's happened already. Here's some gothic warband are caught by surprise by this massive enemy charge, but the enemy charge is stopped and I'm able to push in reinforcements. My guys are mad for man better and the uh, arrival of these axemen means the fight should be okay. Meanwhile I'm pulling spearmen from the center over to help out in this cavalry battle on the flank where things may not be going our way. The enemy have a big numerical advantage and are coming over the crest of the hill in uh, large numbers but of course since they're just getting stuck against my lighter cavalry they are now vulnerable to this spear charge which seems to push many of the enemies back down the hill and I'm going to chase them as best I can to make sure those cataphracts stay off my flank to keep the main fight safe in the middle. That main fight is going on in a very disorganized fashion. We're generally fighting downhill. You can see we've encountered the enemy's legionaries, uh, desert legionary defectors, I believe they are, who are pretty good. Well able to actually go man for man with my troops. So we do take losses fighting them, but we do have the local advantage. You can see down the hill I tried to chase off the enemy's missile cab using my own cavalry but unfortunately the enemy's missile cavalry went out of visibility for a second and just because of how the AI works that means my guys just stop and stand there and then get killed by this missile cavalry so it's annoying because I wasn't paying attention. I was micromanaging what's happening up here where you can see some of the enemy's units are starting to fall back. I've got more cavalry charging down the hill to try and drive off some more of the enemy's skirmishers there. I need to get rid of them. Luckily for me, an enemy general is killed. It wasn't their commanding general, it was the one in the reinforcement army, but it's still hopefully going to affect their morale. We appear to be winning out on that flank battle and here in the central battle charging down the hill. The Therakus himself is now in the melee, fighting with the survivors of these enemy forces. I'm starting to wipe them out. The balance bar is slowly shifting to a more even position at this point. There are still more enemy units to fight, though, still charging up the hill, and we'll charge down the hill towards them. The enemy spearmen are weak against my troops, so I'm confident that even my really depleted units will do okay against the enemy. I've also got my skirmish units now out of ammunition, just doing some good by driving the enemy's skirmish units away. They probably wouldn't be able to beat them in melee, but we just want to stop the enemy from firing, keep them moving, that's our deal for us. So they're going to be going backwards and forwards, fighting enemy units and driving them off. But uh, here in the centre you can see we've defeated the main body of the enemy's heavy infantry. The balance bar now starting to shift in our favour. The enemy's general deploys his heavy cavalry up the hill to fight in melee with my guys who are rushing down after the enemy. And uh, my guys are going to be slaughtered by this particular situation. These enemy heavy cav are very good against my melee infantry, so I'm going to have to be careful. But I do have the numerical advantage, so I may be able to still overwhelm and defeat him as this battle starts to come to an end. We've got enemy units uh, all over the place, as are our own. We're just chasing them down in all directions. It's mostly these uh, missile units that are left, who are just going to skirmish away from us. But at this point, uh, they actually just start to mass rout, so I don't really need to chase them down, even though my cavalry are starting to do that. The enemy have realized that they're losing. They didn't lose their general in that battle, but they did lose so much of their army that they decided to give up. A period victory for Vithericus indicating how much of our own army we've lost. That was a very bloody battle but we've successfully held off the second Sassanid onslaught. Vithericus has survived and will have a chance to continue his journey in the next episode.
Marcus will make a push south while Safrax enjoys the riches of the Romans next time on the Second Messiah.